I was looking down on myself a lot because of what others were doing to me. You know, Chloe, part of me wishes that I were about 20 years younger because I've spent the last um, I don't know, last week or so listening to your new album. And so I was like, man, if I were 20 years younger, like the way this this would hit right now, <laughs> because I'm an old married <laughs> woman now. So like, you know, all the, the those feelings of angst and love and all those things I don't have to deal with anymore. But I thought about right. it. Um, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like I don't have to deal with it anymore. Like I, I know friends who are still dealing with those issues and they're they're my age, but I was like, damn, if this would have came out of college, <laughs> I would have been off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's a great <laughs> album. Yeah, it's a great album. And we'll we'll talk about that more in the, in a minute as well as many of the other projects that you have. Um but first I want to start by asking you a question that I ask every guest that appears on the podcast, and that is when did you become unbothered? When did I become unbothered? Oh, see, I can't really answer that honestly if I said all the time because <laughs> sometimes I do get bothered. But when I'm unbothered is when I'm on the stage because mm -hmm. I, all I care about is how I feel in that moment. That's the one time I'm unbothered. <laughs> the one, well, you know, it's, it's, you deal with an extraordinary amount of shit i mean to be honest and so i can understand and you've been very honest about like how certain things have bothered you which i think a lot of people kind of uh, appreciate um what has made you decide to sort of have that level of transparency with people which is very apparent in your new album uh, in pieces yes well i believe all of us have a lot of things and daily issues that we go through and it's unfair and dishonest to talk about art where you're supposed to be open and honest and not talk about the feelings that inspired them. For me, there are days where I'm more confident than others. And there are days when it's hard for me to even pick myself up because of how in my head I am or how insecure I feel. And especially girls and boys in my peer group, we're dealing with so much this generation because we have so much in front of us with social media and it's so much easier to compare ourselves to others that we constantly look at ourselves like maybe we're not good enough. So with the platform that I'm given, I want people to know that I struggle with the same thing. So it doesn't make you abnormal because you have those same thoughts and feelings and insecurities. And instead of looking at it as a weakness, it's actually our strength. Those are the things that make us special. Those are the things that make us great. And that's what that's why I really wanted to touch on that and highlight. So we all feel less alone. Uh, how would you describe your relationship with social media? My relationship with social media is like a toxic relationship without the Internet, without social media. My sister and I would have never been discovered. That's how we were discovered because of YouTube. And that that's how we got discovered from YouTube. So with me. I'm like, okay, I get to connect with my fans. People get to find out more about me because of online. And the negative side of it is that anyone can say anything good or bad, but that's freedom of speech. So it's not really what's wrong with people and what they say. We all have a right to our opinion. And I just choose to ignore it now because it does get to me. It does affect me. It does make me sad sometimes. And I'm like, man, if only you knew me in real life, you wouldn't say these things because I'm a pretty chill person, you know, I'm such a goofball and mush ball inside. So, but you can't please everybody. So it's like my, it's a relationship that I want to stay in, but sometimes it's not healthy. So yeah, <laughs> social media is like a toxic relationship. Um, well, I mean, you know, people have the, the freedom to say what they want. You're right. Um, but they also have the freedom to get cussed out. So there's that part <laughs> based off some yeah, of the things exactly. that they say. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, um, and, and by the way, I hope you know that most of those people who may say negative things about you online, they wouldn't, you know what they would do if they met you in person, ask for a damn autograph. That's what they would do. Yeah. And, and what made me feel a little bit better is that when I would see people like critique my career choices or how I make music or things like that, I, I'm like asking myself, 
well, you're behind a computer typing this, watching me do it. So I, I have to learn to not take that into consideration because sometimes it'll really bring me down and I'll really think that the opinion is valid. But then I have to remember, remind myself, well, what are they doing? And that's how I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> that That's a, a good, healthy perspective to have. Uh, speaking of your career choices, let's talk about in pieces. Uh, as I said at the top of this podcast, I, I do I, I do wish this album would have maybe came out when I was in college, when I was embroiled in a few toxic relationships. Uh, <laughs> pray it away. <laughs> let's start there. <laughs> okay. Um, I would love to know how you channeled that song. Yes. So... This incredible songwriter and artist, Jazzy, and I wrote this song and pray it away. Whew. And it's like, you know what? Instead of stooping myself to your level, instead of lessening my character, instead of doing something I might regret because of the pain you're causing me, I'm just going to pray it away. And in the song, it was, you know, to the person you're in another relationship with. But if you think about it, you can pray away any negative person, any negative situation. And I feel like boundaries are healthy. You can always love someone from afar. I I think I've learned to master the art of that because I know if something isn't serving me or making me feel good, I just block it out of my life, literally from relationships to friends, you know, things like that, because we owe it to ourselves to be happy. So if there's anything that's making us feel less than that, or like we're not good enough or unworthy, pray it away. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because just by the song title, before the song started playing, I had a totally different song in mind what it might be. <laughs> and then when it started, I was like, oh, okay, we into it now. <laughs> <laughs> um, this album seems very uh, personal. And uh, I-, I would like for you to go back as you were writing it. I know, you know, it took a little bit to kind of put together, but like, how would you describe sort of the mental space you were in as you were putting this al- album together? The mental space that I was in, it wasn't the healthiest one. And I really used music as my crutch and my therapy. Because when you have this idea of what your life is like in your head and what it's supposed to be like and what you always thought it was, when you come across situations and information that kind of disrupts everything that you thought you knew, it makes you look like it's something that you did or something's wrong with you. So I was looking down on myself a lot because of what others were doing to me. And I was, it's like, I was beating myself up because of how wrong people were treating me. And that's not fair to myself, but that's what I did. And that's why I really wanted the artwork to be that photo of me holding my heart in my hand because I'm always taking my heart out to give it to others. But instead of looking at it as it's a weakness, I'm just emitting light from it. So that's why the heart is illuminating. So through that, instead of looking at it like a bad thing, it's a good thing. How I love is a superpower. How I see good in a lot of situations is a superpower. So instead of thinking that I'm naive, thinking that I, I'm not mindful, I things like that, that I would tell myself when I get in these situations, like, man, I wish I paid attention here, man, I wish I protected myself, man, I wish I wasn't so open. That's okay. I don't have to change myself because of other people. I just have to just protect myself, but there's no need to change it. And that's why I, I wrote the first demo on the album, which was hard on my sleeve, because Instead of looking at it like it was a bad thing, I looked at it as it was my strength. Mm. So how do you prevent yourself from becoming hardened? Like you said, you um, feel like you protect yourself, but you don't want to change the essence of who you are. So how do you sort of prevent yourself from getting hardened and going in the opposite direction? That's a great question. (laughs) Because for that, if I'm being completely honest, I have to give my godmom a lot of credit for that because of all of the things that I've been through, I'm shocked that I have this healthy of a mindset. And the times where I felt myself kind of slipping or, 
even letting my heart get filled with fog or anything like that. She would be the one to be like, hey, Chloe, maybe look at it from this perspective. Don't stoop down to this level, certain things like that. So I feel all of us need somebody around us who won't always lie to us and say yes, just because it'll make us comfortable. And even Hallie, like she's an Aries, so she's quick to call things out and, and everything. So I have people around me who love me, who keep me in check and keep me grounded because it's easy to allow yourself to get hardened. It's easy to become filled with resentment. It's easy. It's easy. But that's why I think it's important for us to do the self work and the healing so that just because you're hurt, you don't decide to hurt others. Yeah, um, I've uh, uh, back in the day, I dated a cancer. And <laughs> one thing I will say about cancer, because I believe you are a cancer, correct? <laughs> yes, is that it is very true that cancers wear all eight thousand emotions all on their sleeves. <laughs> um, that I, though I think women cancers are are much different than than men cancers for sure. But um, yeah, women you, yeah, are super. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, I don't. Uh, think but that, it, I don't date a cancer man. <laughs> you said you wouldn't, or you you never have. I I would not date a cancer. <laughs> oh yeah i was like they they were on my do not ever again do this again list after that particular <laughs> relationship yeah. yeah cancer men are another level <laughs> yeah they are i was like i i, I don't have the nerves for this like this is <laughs> this is something else but you you do seem like <laughs> I, you, I think you strike everybody as somebody who's very self-aware and very in touch um with your emotions where does that come from for you that comes from regretting not speaking up for myself. That comes from being in my room, looking at the wall and being like, man, if I would have done this, maybe I would have been happier. Maybe it would have been a different outcome. So I think I just got tired. I got tired of being the doormat to everyone in my life and I wanted to take my power back because I was so used to that feeling when I realized I was self-inflicting that feeling on myself as well. I was like, okay, no, I, I need a change. And that's why even now I'm trying to remind myself every day, like, you deserve this. You're supposed to be here. You work really hard. You're, you're supposed to have this. You're supposed to feel good. Because I think a lot of us, we have imposter syndrome when good things happen to us because we think we're not worthy. So I think I just got tired. What's a situation that you think about? Because um, like you just said, like you wish you would have kind of advocated more for yourself. What's a situation that still bothers you where you feel like you didn't do that? I'd rather not talk about it, to be honest. Okay. Like when it comes to like romantic relationships, I've mastered it. I, I'm i quick to like cut things off, but like there's still things that I'm healing from. So it's not the easiest to talk about. Understood. Um, well, we were talking about uh, in pieces um, and, you know, as we talk about your various career choices, uh, one of which uh, was being in Swarm which uh, I've, I've watched and that's a dark series, but it's a great series. So I'm, I'm all in. Um, tell me how you landed that role. Yes. So I got an email from my agents and it said in the email subject, untitled Donald Glover project. And for everyone who knows me, my close friends and family, I am the biggest Donald Glover fan. I've always been for years and years. He's always been on my vision board every year. I've always been like, I want to work with him, whether it's music or acting. I just think he's the coolest. So when I saw that, I was immediately intrigued. And they were like, okay, uh, watch The Piano Teacher and catch up on Atlanta. And you'll have a Zoom with Janine and Donald to talk about, you know, the stuff. This was before I even saw the script. I was like, oh, hell yeah. So I already knew Atlanta because I love that show. And I watched The Piano Teacher. I, I bought it. I had my laundry. Thank God I watched it during the day. I thought it was an innocent French film. No, I was stunned. 
I've loved it. It's now one of my favorite movies. It's one of the most disturbing things. <laughs> and when I finished watching it, I said, okay, what kind of project is this about to be? So after that, my mind was like, what is this going to be about? So, you know, I had a Zoom with Donald and Janine and I fell in love with them and their energy and they both were just so amazing. And so then they sent the script. So I, I read the first episode and just off of that first one, I immediately said yes, because I loved everything about Marissa and I loved Marissa and Dre's relationship. And it was unpredictable. It was shocking. And I felt like I could see myself within Marissa because on the outside, she's the one who is carrying her and Dre. She is the bright sun, but she actually was battling her own demons that we didn't find out about until a little later. And the similarity between Marissa and Dre, Dre would inflict pain onto others and Marissa would inflict pain onto herself. So it's like this weird duality that the two of them had. And I just thought it was incredible writing. Yeah, I mean, um, the one thing I know that a lot of people kind of have limited it to just being about stand culture, but it's about like way more than just, you know, that. I mean, it is a lot about um, kind of how people cope with sort of tragedy and mental health, like all these other things. But, you know, you're sort of sucked into the stand culture part of it. But it's about like much broader themes than that. Um, you mentioned that you, uh, you saw, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. I think when people actually watch it, not to spoil anything, but the obsession is actually with Marissa and it'll explain the last episode. And when she finally got to meet her idol, she saw her deceased sister. So that's what I love about Donald and Janine, because it's all about twists and turns and what you think something is actually about. It's not. Um, of course, uh, it, before I even um, really got a chance to sit down and watch the series, naturally, I saw all of the reaction because this is the first time you filmed a sex scene, right? I'm a big Snowfall fan, so I love Dam Damson Idris. Um, and, you know, what was so funny is like, I didn't really understand what why the reaction was the way that it was. I know people had memes and jokes and all those sorts of things. But were you surprised by the way people reacted to this? I don't expect people to understand everything that I do. And I now have an expectation of like, for some reason, if I do something that someone else does with me, it's blown out of proportion. So I've kind of gotten used to that. So that's why I'm speaking of unbothered. When it comes to that, I'm very unbothered. And I just don't read it because I'm an actress. I was playing a character. I wasn't Chloe in that moment. The sex scene existed in that even before I got the role of Marissa. Originally, Marissa was offered to Dominique who played Dre. And I think because it's me, people just blow it out of proportion. But if the people actually watch the show and watch the scene, you see my butt cheeks for two seconds in the mirror and everything else is on Damson. And you maybe see like tiny bit of my side hip, like an inch. And it's really about Damson and Dominique looking at each other while this act is going. And all you really hear is an audible moan or two from me. Well, not two, but like, it's not, you You heard me more than you saw me. So I thought, it was, I thought it was quite funny, to be honest. I was laughing about it. It didn't really bother me or affect me because I think I'm just used to it. So when you are constantly used to people making think pieces about you every week, it doesn't hold weight anymore. It's like, oh, okay, something else, doo -doo -doo. It's something else. Doo -doo -doo. Well, I, I had the same reaction that you did. Like the way that people were hyping it up on social media, I, I'm like thinking, we, I'm about to see something crazy. And I was like, you don't even see her. Like, I mean, there are, you know, you see one little part of you and it's like, it really, the entire power of the scene, as you said, is about him looking at Dre. And it's like, you know, and, and the, strangeness of their relationship, which obviously later becomes un unveiled in the rest of the episode. So it was sort of like, <laughs> I thought it was, um, as you said, a, a little bizarre that people reacted so strongly to it. And maybe it's because I think for a lot of people and, and, and perhaps speak to this is that because you've sort of quote unquote grown up before our eyes, if you want to put it that way, do you think 
that is or has something to do with, with why people seem to um, have a hard time seeing you in these other spaces. I used to think that. Now, not so much. I'm going to be 25 and I have been honest with who I am for a minute now. So I used to write it off of that as that. And instead of trying to figure out or wrap my mind around why that is when it comes to me, I just keep it pushing and I'm grateful people are talking. I'm grateful that people are tuning in and it's just, now I just write it off in my head. It's like, it's just a part of it. Um, do you, um, are you at least proud of yourself for the fact that uh, just in the space of a very short period of time, you've shown a lot of range. You go from swarm and now praise this is out where it's <laughs> the total opposite in many ways of what, uh, the role that people may have seen you in Swarm, but you know, how does that feel to you that you have two very successful, very different projects that are out at once? I'm very grateful to God. And for me, I never want to get stuck in doing one thing. That's no fun. I don't want to just play like a ditzy college girl. I don't just want to play a sexy kind of role. I don't just want to play a mean girl. I want to play anything and everything. And as Black people, we we can be and are any and everything. And I'm a Black woman. So there's a complete wide range variation of characters that I can play. So instead of being predictable, instead of doing what people want to see from me, I like to do the complete opposite. And that's why I take jobs like Swarm and Praise This and even Girl from North Country, which I'm so excited to go into production with, like Midas Touch, where it's a true story about the Black woman on Wall Street. She wore her high heels and her tight skirts and pants, but she was very smart, smarter than a lot of those men in that building. So I'm picking these characters where I feel like they represent Black women in an honest and authentic light. Uh, with Praise This, um, which has a very, you know, robust uh, cast, um, how did you wind up getting connected with that project? So at the top of the pandemic, I got an offer to self-tape. I set up my little video camera, put on my makeup, had my little outfit. Hallie read the lines off screen for me and... <laughs> I had to sing a gospel song. I sang I Love the Lord by Whitney Houston. And I sang a modern song. I think it was Honeymoon Avenue by Ariana Grande. And I sent him a tape and I didn't hear anything for a minute. And I got the call that they wanted me for Sam. So once I found that out, it wasn't immediate either. Once I found that out, we went into production, I think like a year and a half, two years later. So timing is absolutely everything. I'm so happy it came to light. I'm so happy with the cast that became a part of it. Because when I first signed on to the project, it was just me. So I didn't know who would be my family within this and who else would sign on. And a part of me was a little nervous because I was like, would anyone want to be a part of a movie that starred me? <laughs> I was like, I know Will Packer and Universal are doing it and you know they have heavy weight with their names, but I, I was a little nervous about that. There, That's the imposter syndrome thing again. And when the cast fully came together and we shot, we were laughing every day on set. It was just so much fun to make. And I think you can feel that on the screen. I think that's why it's really special. And being able to work on the music with Harvey Mason and Tank, it was really, really cool because it also expanded my vocal range when I was just focusing on gospel songs and things like that for that those months. And while I was creating my album in pieces, I think subconsciously I picked up on some of that stuff. And that makes sense for some of the vocal choices and the backgrounds and the harmonies and why I put choir, a choir, an actual choir on Pray It Away, the end of Make It Look Easy and the end of Feel Me Cry as well. So I think because it felt so good in that world, I think that's where a piece of it was subconsciously put into in pieces. Yeah, it's a really delightful and, and, and fun movie. I got a chance to see a screener of it. Um, and I think for people, say, who enjoy something like Sister Act, right, like this will, or, or, or Pitch Perfect, like this will sort of 
um, remind you a little bit of that, but the singing and everything else is like really spectacular, like a, a very, just a, like a really fun movie is how I would describe it. Um, you mentioned on set that it was very uh, lighthearted. Now, did you film this before or after? You filmed this before Swarm, I assume, right? Two months after Swarm. Two months after Swarm. So <laughs> what did that feel like going from something so dark to then all of a sudden it's like, hey, this is much lighter. <laughs> it felt great. It felt fantastic. And you know who does that and balances it so beautifully? Dominique Fishback. I have the greatest respect for that woman because she goes from Judas and the Messiah she goes from Transformers that's dropping in June to being a serial killer in Swarm and to see her range and how she doesn't typecast her own self and she likes to challenge herself and play different characters and things like that. She really inspires me in that way. All right, well, listen, um, there's uh, a lot more I wanna ask you about. Um, definitely wanna ask you about uh, Make It Look Easy from In Pieces because I think there's a lot of women who could certainly uh, relate to that, but um, and a little bit about the start of your career, but uh, going to take a really quick break and we'll be right back with more with Chloe Bailey. Um, before the break, uh, we were talking about uh, Praise This. Uh, one quick note, you know who really surprised me in that is Drewski. Yes, he killed yeah. it. What was it like working with him? Oh, it was amazing. I will love him all my life. He's he's just the best. And when you direct and write and produce and put together your own skits, like he does for mass consumption, you already kind of know what you're doing. You're already acting behind screen. It's just that instead of that big, expensive movie camera, it's your phone. And my godbrother Joe put me on to Drewski, like I think two months before I started working on Praise This. And I fell in love with him. I just thought he was the funniest guy. And so we were trying to cast our Aaron the week before we were shooting because our original Aaron uh, had other obligations. And we were trying to find a comedian who could fill Aaron's shoes. And so Tina was like, what about this guy? What about this guy? And so because she really wanted me to have a hand in an essay and who would be the missing piece in Oil Factory, which I shout out to her. I love her so much. I was like, Tina, what about this guy named Drewski? She was like, Drewski? I was like, yeah, Drewski. He's amazing. Joe told me about him. I was like, here's his social media. Check him out. So because we were in the studio when this conversation was happening while I was making music for the film. And she comes back to me the next day and she's like, hmm. She does this little thing like, hmm. she said, I like Drewski. She said, I set up a meeting with him tomorrow morning. I'll let you know how it goes. She walked out the studio. <laughs> and then next thing you know, he was cast. And he is the perfect asset to Oil Factory. And he is just the best spirit. And I think all of us, Tina, Will, we all knew he would be able to bring it because he does it so organically and naturally with his skits. So it it was it wasn't really anything new for him if you really think about it. Yeah, I know that you're in an interesting season in your career just uh, because you're doing everything as um, now you're a solo artist, obviously uh, musically. And I re read a recent interview that you did where you said you had to learn who you are individually. What does that process look like for you? The process looks like a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> the process <laughs> looks like things blowing up in your face for you to see what was hidden underneath. And through that, a lot of questions that have been unanswered all your life, you finally have answers to them and you finally understand why you are the way you are. And that's when healing can truly begin. So I'm still figuring out exactly, exactly who Chloe is. But one thing I can say is that she's a warrior. I am stronger than I, ever thought I was. And I wear my middle name, Elizabeth, very proudly because my late grandmother's name was Elizabeth. And she went through a lot in her life. And still, she always had the biggest smile on her face and the biggest heart and the loudest laugh. And you would have never known what she's gone through because of how she wore it so well.
Now, was the plan always uh, with you and your sister that eventually you all would have your own individual careers? I don't think we thought it would be in the cards this soon, to be honest. I know we'd always make jokes like Hallie would say, man, you're going to be the biggest pop star. And I would tell her, man, you're going to be the biggest movie star. So we we saw where our directions were headed. And when I would be a little girl, like I would dance in my room for hours. Like I had my own concert with my own dancers because I really love to dance. And when Hallie had to go off to London for The Little Mermaid, and it was like weird travel restrictions because of the pandemic. That was that was the first time we ever were apart from each other. So us over a span of like two and a half, three years, we didn't see each other as much as we have all our lives. And because of that, we were forced to get comfortable with the feeling of us being on our own, which was really hard. We both had separation anxiety. We both had moments of self-doubt where I felt like I couldn't do anything without her and she felt the same. I remember she'd call me on set and we'd be on FaceTime and we wouldn't even say anything. I would just be there on the phone so she knew I was there while she was filming. And I think we just needed each other as we've always had each other as our anchors. So it was really scary. And for me, I didn't know what to do with myself without her. I was shooting grownish and going home and I felt so unfulfilled and I was creating music and beats, but I just, I was, I didn't feel like there was a direction or a path or a purpose to what I was doing every day. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna take these sad songs that I'm writing and I'm gonna, I'm gonna put into a project for the time being. And that's how it sparked. So, um, if you, you know, you said that it came sooner than you thought, uh, you guys, you know, sort of separating and, and following your own individual paths. So how did you know it was the right time? I feel like God will tell me. Like I was creating this project for three years. I put random songs out, but the project didn't come out till now. And I just trust God and just trust the timing. And even with everything that's been going on the past month and a half. I didn't know when Storm was coming out. I didn't know when Praise This was coming out. Praise This was delayed for two years. And I'm like, okay, God, I hear you. All of these things are lined up perfectly. And then I go on tour for the album. And I'm like, I couldn't have put together a better plan for my life than God above did. So I just learn to trust. I just keep my head down and I work and I just trust and I go with the flow. I go with the flow. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, as you mentioned, Hallie is the new Little Mermaid. Um, how did you feel when she landed that role? When she first got the offer to audition, I knew I knew she was going to get it. She was like, me? Like, I don't look like what people think Ariel looked like. I was like, no, you embody Ariel from her voice to her beautiful eyes, to her soft strength, to her sweetness. That's very Ariel. She didn't have to change herself to become this character. And when I saw her at the screen test, I cried because it was like, it was it, it was it. And I don't think anyone's voice could sound closer to a siren than hers. <laughs> so I am just incredibly proud of her and knowing how hard she worked for the past three years from the swimming lessons with her tail on to, you know, the workouts early, early in the morning to being alone overseas to all of that. That's why she has Poseidon because we got her the cat. So she felt less alone because she didn't have her siblings to cuddle on because we were in the States. I am just so incredibly proud of her and I'm happy that she did this film because she was finally able to stand in her own power and her strength and realize that she is just as special on her own. And I think we both had to realize that, that we're still special individually and together. And from that, I think that's what makes us stronger when we're together because 
we're strong from every angle now. And I just can't wait to see how many Black girls' lives she's going to change just by them seeing that they can be anything that they want to be because she did it. It, um, Yeah, as you just said, you know, like individually, the strength that you all carry. Um, But do you all have uh, any plans or uh, thought about reuniting for another album at some point? Absolutely. We always talk about that. And while we were both in L.A. for, I think, two weeks at the same time, we got in the studio. I had Apollo, my kitten. She had her cat beside it. And we made a song and we're like trying to create virtually, but I think we'll really dive down into it once we're in the same place at the same time for a minute. So it's definitely coming. It's not the end of us whatsoever. Um, well, with your own solo project, um, what would you say uh, gave you the most anxiety about In Pieces? What gave me the most anxiety about In Pieces is thinking that people wouldn't get it. They wouldn't care. They. My anxiety came from the outside and me doubting myself and saying, what if they don't like my voice tone? What if they don't like the way I sing? What if this, what if that? And once I got out of that and just focused solely on creating and the art, I had the best time. And my favorite parts of creating this album would have to be the first year and the last year. The second year was a lot of creative blocks because that was after Have Mercy. I was in my head about what people wanted from me when I would drop little snippets or teasers online, people would find something negative about it, even down to Light Flex saying I make empire music. But even now after I released my album, now people are like, oh, she should have put Light Flex on there. <laughs> and I I just cared so much about what people thought. And even told you when I teased that online last year, people said it was shit. And knowing now that they love it because they heard it in its full context. And of course the iconic Missy Elliott is on it. I think people get it now. And art takes time for people to understand and to get, and not everybody's gonna like the same thing because it's art. It's all about perspective. Mm -hmm. Not everyone's gonna see or hear music the same way. So I think what gave me the most anxiety was my self doubting and, and thinking that I couldn't do something or doubting the gift God gave me. And once I just shed that and just focused on creating instead, because that'll never really go away, that's when everything opened up. I hope you know Made It Look Easy is like an anthem, right? Because like, I, it's so many, yeah, so many women, I don't know how you couldn't relate to that song. Um, for you, what was the motivation behind that particular song? Ooh. Um... <laughs> The motivation behind that song, a week before that, something really heavy um, transpired. And I felt really numb and dull for a minute. And no one really knew or understood what exactly I was going through because I made it look easy. and. There would be times where right before I'd walk on stage, I'd just be crying, broken. And then I'd wipe my tears and walk right on that stage. And it wouldn't be about like work or career. Um, so when I went into the studio that day, I really just wanted to make something fun and creative. I, I just kind of wanted to distract myself. And I was going through beats and I wasn't really liking any of them. And I heard this specific one. It was really simple. It was just these synth chords. And I immediately pulled out my phone and I just started writing and singing. And usually I go into the studio and will freestyle or things like that. And then I'll for put the melodies all together at once. But this song literally wrote itself in five minutes. And as I was writing it and as I was recording it, I was um, very emotional. So it even took a minute for me to actually listen back to the demo for a while because I knew where I where it came from and why I wrote it. But 
once I actually looked at the beauty of the song and saw how so many people can relate to it, I was really proud of it. And when that moment happened, I was in New York and I was listening to mixes of the songs. And as the ending of Make It Look Easy was playing, I saw a single mother with her child walking down the street. I saw a man with a briefcase who looked quite upset. I saw a homeless man. I saw all these different types of walks of life. And all you hear is make it look easy, make it look easy as we were driving down the road. And that's when I knew it was bigger than myself. And that's when I knew that I'm fulfilling um, the purpose and the reason why God put me on this earth and to make music. Because from my pain, I'm using it to heal myself and in turn, hopefully heal others. So that song holds a lot of emotional weight more than I think people really realize. And I've never gotten asked that question before about what happened that made me write the song. Well, anybody who listens to it, or certainly that was my first reaction when I did, and I can I can see that it, it still creates um, emotion within you. Is like my first thought was like this song is coming from a different place, right? Like you can tell when when artists write songs or when they sing songs that like it's coming from a different place, from a very personal place. And I made a note. I was like, this feels like the most personal song on this album. Um, that's how it felt like it to was. me just as, yeah, as a listener. Yeah, it was um, the last song. It was the last song I created from head to toe for that album. It was the last one I wrote. And I was like, I can't tell a story about giving and showing my heart without showing all of it. So I felt that it was really important to have it on there. Well, before we get you out of here, um, uh, we'll, we'll lighten the mood a bit. <laughs> we'll lighten the mood. Uh, um, there's a game I play with every guest that appears on Jamel Hill is Unbothered. And the game is called This or That. You, I, Yes, I, I think you'll be good at this, right? Um, it's called This or That. I give you two choices and you must pick okay. one. All right, you got it? Okay. Okay, so I'm, my sources tell me you're a big Ozark fan, which I am too. Love Ozark. That's my show. I, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Wendy or Ruth? Ruth. <laughs> and, Ruth. And, and that Wendy is one of the most diabolical television characters in history. She is so awful. <laughs> so awful. So what what did you think about the way the series ended? I loved it. I know it wasn't what people wanted, but I loved it. Like I don't like things that are predictable. I don't like things to have a cliche happy ending because that's not life. I loved it. Yeah, because you knew at the end of the day the birds were going to be standing, right? <laughs> it's like you you knew it. Like they were never going to get the payback they deserve. Wendy was never going to get hers. Like I knew it. I was like, she never going to get hers. It's not going to happen. Yeah, but I love how open-ended they leave it. You know? Yeah, it no, they did a good to me. They did they did a good job. All right. Uh crazy in love or love on top? Crazy in love. <laughs> wow, that was really easy for you, huh? <laughs> I know I have a feeling why. <laughs> why? Um, because uh didn't you am I mistaken about this, but I feel like on social media, didn't you and your sister do a cover of that? We did it to best thing I never had, pretty hurts. Honestly, we did like eight to ten Beyonce songs, but right. we never did crazy in love. We did love on top. We did love you on did, top. We did love you on did top. do love on top. Okay. Now, um, I read that Beyonce gave you some notes for in pieces. Uh, did you incorporate any of her notes? <laughs> I incorporated all the notes she gave me. I mean, it's Beyonce. <laughs> I did. And one of the <laughs> told me to add 808s at the end of Cheapak. And she said, not the beginning. Don't mess up the structure and the simple of the song but just kind of give it a little at the end and she's always motivating me to add for my production to things even on beats I didn't start off so that always makes me feel good <laughs> all right and finally um on in pieces your collaboration with future which I think is called cheat back 
or your collaboration with Missy, told you. Which one's my favorite? Mm-hmm. Oh, I can't, I can't, I can't pick. It's like picking your favorite kid. <laughs> like some days I feel more, more that way. I love them both. And I'm so grateful to all three of the artists that I had on this project and graced on it with me, little old me. So <laughs> I'm just really happy because they all inspire me in different ways. Well, the, I think the people would be surprised about the future collaboration because that's an acoustic song. Like, I wasn't expecting that at all. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> that's what I love about Future. He's an amazing songwriter. And yes, people give him credit for his music and stuff, but I don't think people actually think of him as an incredible songwriter. Like, he wrote Drunk in Love. And he writes other incredible songs in... I love his tone on this record because it reminds me of How to Love by Lil Wayne. And I love how folksy this song sounds where it reminds me of like a Dolly Parton record or like four or five seconds with Rihanna, Paul McCartney and Kanye. I just, it's always really great to mix genres and different styles on different instrumentals. All right, well, Listen, Chloe, thank you so much for spending this time with me. I know you're super busy and you have a lot going on. And, um, you know, uh, listen, I, I'm sure you, I'll say it for you because you're too graceful to probably say it, but man, fuck them people online. <laughs> like they, they just always have like, you know, you know how it goes. I mean, you're unfortunately in a business where, you know, people are being judged as almost a part of the gig, but um, it's not a lot of people that can hardly anybody can do what you do. Like to be able to be just as great in both arenas is really a testament to how truly remarkably talented you are. And so I look forward to all the projects you have coming up, all the music that you have coming up. And uh, I just want you to know that I, I really personally very much enjoyed this album. Thank you so much. That means a lot. And thank you for inspiring me and having me. So this was really fun. Yeah, I, I had fun as well. Um, all right, y'all. Chloe is getting out of here. Y'all know what's coming up next. Final segment. Fuck it, I'm bothered. <laughs>